Hello and welcome to Rossio Christi Television. What motivated Hitler to commit genocide? That's what I'm asking my next guest in this episode. Rossio Christi is a campus apologetics alliance. We set up Christian apologetics clubs on the university, college, community college, and high school campuses throughout the United States and internationally as well. However, we're not just reaching students. Uh, a few years back, we started Rossio Christi Professor, or RC Prof for short, and we are connecting with professors who are confessors. These are Christian professors, regardless of where they are located, who are Christians, and because they are Christians, that influences their vocation, not just as a teacher, but in the specific field they have a PhD in. They give not only what are called prof talks, which you can find on Rasio Christie's YouTube channel, but also, most importantly, they are on campus influencing the next generation, discipling your children and grandchildren on their very own school campus. Just go to RasioChristie.org, click on RC Prof up at the top, and you can find out more about that. The purpose of our organization is to help make people aware of the evidence for the Christian worldview and to point people to truth with a capital T, which is what we call our program, Truth Matters. Joining me is Dr. Richard Weichart. Dr. Weichart is a professor of modern European history at California State University Stanislaus, and he's the author of six books, including Hitler's Religion, the Twisted Beliefs That Drove the Third Reich. If you don't have a copy of this, you need to get one as soon as possible. And this is the book we'll be highlighting today in this episode. He's been here a number of times before. So Dr. Weichart, welcome back to Truth Matters. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Tony. How widespread was racism in German society in the early 20th century? Racism was rampant in Germany, and by the way, not just in Germany, the United States uh, as well, across all levels of society. So if you would go to a German school and look at a biology textbook or an anthropology textbook, maybe at a higher level at uh, college and such, they would teach that there were racial hierarchies, that some humans were superior, others were inferior, not just physically, but also mentally, and even morally, because uh, by the 1890s and early 1900s, there were many biologists and anthropologists and medical professors who were arguing that morality was ingrained, biologically ingrained. Uh, and so if you read uh, Darwin's Origin of Species, which was translated into German, uh, they contained, in fact, these very ideas. And Ernst Haeckel, a prominent German Darwinist, was uh, teaching similar ideas as well. So this was considered the standard science of the day in the early 20th century, that races were different and that some had greater intellectual capacities and some lesser. There's a second kind of racism, however, that was also rampant in German society, and that's anti-Semitism, uh, particular racism against the Jews. Interestingly, in the 19th century, there had been something of a shift in uh, the way that anti-Jewish uh, ideology was framed. And that is that before the 19th century, a lot of the anti-Jewish ideology had been uh, opposing them as a religion, opposing Judaism. Uh, however, in the mid-19th century, many secular thinkers who no longer really cared about religion in the same way that uh, earlier Christian, uh, at least nominally Christian people had, uh, began construing the Jews as a race and they started applying some of the same stereotypes that had been built up over centuries uh, to the Jews, such as that the Jews were greedy, that they were lascivious, that they were deceitful, that they had all these immoral traits. And they started claiming it wasn't just a part of their religion, it was part of their biological makeup. And so this kind of racism was becoming very prominent also by the early 20th century. And Hitler was going to imbibe this kind of anti-Semitic ideology that saw the Jews not as a religion, but as a race. So there was both of these different kinds of races and the idea of racial hierarchies in general, in which case very often the African uh, blacks were considered sort of toward the bottom of the, and also Austra Australian Aborigines were considered toward the bottom of the racial hierarchy. And then it was also this anti-Semitic uh, racism as well, both of which Hitler was going to uh, imbibe. If you look in his book, uh, Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, there's a chapter called Nation and Race, which was the only chapter to be published separately 
and used for propaganda purposes in German schools, in Hitler Youth Organizations, other Nazi organizations. Uh, it taught both of those, the, the racial hierarchy in general, and then also very staunch anti-Semitic ideology. Now, Hitler's usually the person who people have in mind most often when they think about dictators and genocide, although a lot of people haven't studied Hitler's life, so we definitely want to encourage them to get your book uh, on Hitler, but also Mein Kampf, which obviously is a, uh, you know, a, a, a autobiography, uh, his book that talks about his worldview, his mindset, which a lot of people need to understand. And, you know, you look to these primary sources that helps you understand uh, how this is still prevalent uh, amongst people today in the way that they think. Now, of course, Hitler was a thinker. There's a difference between thinking and having good thoughts or bad thoughts. But uh, what thinkers influenced Hitler's racial ideology? Yeah, in, as in many cases of trying to track uh, intellectual ancestry, there's no... Uh, it, it's very difficult to tease out the influences. And in Hitler's case, it's actually particularly difficult because Hitler tried not to identify himself as a disciple of any particular individual. And in fact, he wasn't really. He sort of drew from a broad array of thinkers. And in, in fact, Brigitte Hamann, uh, in a book called Hitler's Vienna, where uh, Hamann's a historian writing about Hitler while he was in Vienna, argues that Hitler drew from a broad array of the press, uh, from a lot of... Uh, magazines and such, uh, and doesn't seem as being influenced by any particular uh, thinker. And I think there's something to be said for that. However, I think we can look at per some thinkers in Germany that did have a broad impact upon uh, the culture in general and do seem to have had a either directly or indirectly an impact on Hitler. Sometimes we don't know if Hitler read them in particular, but we know that some of the ideas filtered down to him. So Ernst Haeckel, whom I've already mentioned, uh, Ernst Haeckel was a Darwinian biologist who believed that some races had evolved to higher levels than other races. Uh, and this is clearly an idea that Hitler was going to take up in, in believing that some races were at higher stages of evolutionary development than others. Uh, some were more uh, intellectually developed than others and some more morally developed, again, since they believed in uh, biological basis for morality. So... Uh, Haeckel would be one, but one among many. Uh, Theodor Fritsch was a, a prominent anti-Semitic thinker in the late 19th, early 20th century. Hitler himself mentioned Fritsch on a number of occasion, uh, occasions and uh, recommended his works. Uh, so uh, Theodor Fritsch would be another uh, individual. Theodor Fritsch uh, embraced a social Darwinist version of anti-Semitism. Uh, and there were quite a number of other thinkers that were going to uh, impact Hitler's racism as well. So there wasn't just one thinker, but a whole broad array of them. But I think we can identify a few important individuals like this. Another individual, though, that has sometimes been uh, pointed out is Jörg Lanz von Liebenfels, who was a uh, writer in Vienna while Hitler was living there, and who later claimed that Hitler had uh, come to visit him to get some uh, copies of his uh, periodical called Ostara, where he put forward his ideas of Aryan supremacy and such. And there are a lot of parallels between Hitler's ideas and Lanz von Liebenfels. So it's not outlandish to think that Hitler probably, probably did read Lanz von Liebenfels' writings in Vienna. The problem with tracking that particular influence, though, is that for one thing, Lanz von Liebenfels was not a very reliable source. So his claim that Hitler came and visited him may or may not have been true. And secondly, uh, the same ideas that Lanz von Liebenfels was peddling about eugenics, about Aryan supremacy and such were being peddled by a lot of other thinkers in Vienna at the same time. And I talk about some of those in my book, uh, Hitler's Religion. Uh, and uh, the, some of the specific ideas that Lanz von Liebenfels was uh, promoting about uh, sort of mystical ideas, Hitler really didn't imbibe those. So Hitler may have embraced some of the ideas that Lanz von Liebenfels was putting out about eugenics and, and racism, but not his more mystical kind of ideas. Now, how did Hitler's concern for living space influence his inclination for genocide? Yeah, interestingly, uh, Gerhard uh, Weinberg, who's a very prominent uh, German historian who, uh, at the University of North Carolina, he's written extensively about World War II and about Hitler's uh, ideology. He argues that sort of the most central elements of Hitler's worldview is race and space. So that's a pretty easy way to remember it, right? Race and space. And the second issue, space, 
Uh, it comes from the German word Lebensraum, which means living space, which was an ideology actually developed by Friedrich Ratzel, a late 18th, late 19th century uh, German geographer who had been a Darwinian biologist before he turned geographer. And basically, Ratzel's idea was that uh, organisms are competing for scarce resources, and the most important resource, he thought, was land, space. In other words, if you don't have space, you can't increase your population. So the idea was that you need to increase your land in order to increase your population. And since Hitler thought the Aryans or the German uh, Germans or uh, the, the term Nordic race was also used as a synonym. Since he thought the Nordic or Aryan race was superior, he thought they needed more land to expand into so they could, so their excess population uh, could then uh, move into those areas. So the idea of acquiring new living space, which of course could only be done through warfare, you fighting wars against your uh, neighbors, was integral to his thinking about uh, genocide because he was wanting to clear out those areas so that he could then repopulate them with what he saw as the superior race, the Aryans or the, the Nordic race. So the idea of uh, living space was crucial to his thinking about genocide. And why did Hitler focus uh, so much uh, on his hatred of the Jews? I mean, obviously there's a whole lot of people out there to hate. Uh, interesting, and why we thank God for you, is because you are an expert on the one person who many people would agree it's okay to hate, and that is Hitler. I'm not sure how many people criticize you for saying things about Hitler, bringing up objective history about what he did. I don't think you probably get too many complaints, except from you know neo-Nazis perhaps, but uh, when, when we talk about hate and the hatred that Hitler had for Jews, uh, why was it focused on them? Why not someone else? Where did all that hatred for Jews come from? Interestingly, before I get to the question, you mentioned this about neo-Nazis. I actually did get an uh, email from a neo-Nazi after writing my book, uh, Hitler's Religion, came out. And basically, this neo-Nazi leader told me that he thought I had uh, analyzed Hitler right, despite my antipathy for Hitler, which he didn't appreciate. Uh, but you're right, I don't get much uh, flack for that, uh, just from a few uh, neo-Nazis and such. But concerning his Hitler's hatred for the Jews, uh, there was a, a lot of anti-Semitism in German society, but uh, interestingly, before World War I, there isn't a lot of evidence that Hitler had the kind of at least really intense hatred of the Jews that he was going to have later on. It seems like it developed perhaps right after World War I, and, and perhaps because of the Munich milieu that he was in. He went back to Munich after World War I, and uh, anti-Semitism became rampant at that point among a lot of nationalist circles, in part because there was a communist overthrow of the Bavarian government that took place in March and April of uh, 1919 while Hitler was there. Uh, and a lot of people, there were a, some, a prominent Jew who was a member of that communist uh, government, and a lot of people began associating the communists with the Jews at that point. So uh, although there had been a lot of anti-Semitism in German society before that time, Hitler himself, it seems, probably really became a rabid anti-Semite, at least at this point in 1919. And after that time, Hitler was going to begin to buy into this conspiracy idea that the Jews were part of a, a world conspiracy that had two prongs. One prong was the communists, whom I already mentioned here, whom Hitler, Karl Marx, of course, had been uh, by had come from a Jewish family, although his father had converted to Christianity, and Karl Marx had been baptized also. But he came from a Jewish family, so there was this notion that Marxism came from this Jewish milieu. Uh, and then there were other prominent Jews that were identified, although, of course, most communists were not Jews, but the ones that were Jews, they were, they were identified, and so they sort of said the communists would be part of this Jewish world conspiracy. But the capitalists, of course, were the other prong of it. So you got this idea that the communists and capitalists are really in cahoots, even though they seem to be opposed to each other. They're really in cahoots. They're part of this Jewish world conspiracy, and they're trying to destroy the Germans. So Hitler saw the Jews as being a key enemy because he thought they were trying to undermine the German nation. They were promoting internationalism. Marxism, after all, says working men of the world unite. And Hitler believes that the Germans needed to unite uh, not have the be divided along class lines. In fact, Hitler argued that instead of the class struggle, which the communists, of course, were preaching, we should engage in the race struggle. So 
he sort of pitted those two things against each other. He saw the Jews as being part of this uh, promoting class struggle, even at the same time they're promoting capitalism. But then he wanted to promote race struggle. So he he believed that the Jews were a menace to German society and that they were a uh, cunningly trying to undermine Germans in many different ways. Now, many people are familiar with the fact that many Jews were killed under Hitler's uh, regime and under the Third Reich. Less people, I would say, are familiar with why he hated Jews. But in interesting question I have for you. How did Hitler treat the Jews once he came to power, but before the Holocaust? Yeah, this is important to understand, especially for those who don't have a good uh, understanding of the chronology, because Hitler didn't just begin killing the Jews you know, as soon as he came into power. He actually moved in a more tactical, uh, measured kind of way. Uh, he began uh, trying to drive the Jews out of government positions. That was really one of the first major pieces of legislation on April 7th, 1933. So just a couple of months after he was appointed chancellor, he kicked all the Jews out of government positions. Uh, then he began two years later to forbid intermarriage between Jews and Germans because he thought that that was a horrific event that would uh, mix Jewish and German uh, heredity, which he didn't want to have happen. So that was going to be the Nuremberg Laws of September 1935. And then uh, over the next few years, there was going to be uh, more and more discriminatory legislation. And that was most of what was going on in the 1930s. Uh, was discriminatory legislation before World War II broke out. World War II was going to mark a major shift in a couple of ways. One was that Germany didn't really have a huge Jewish population. It was less than 1% of their population. And by 1939, when World War II broke out, uh, about 60% of the Jewish population emigrated from Germany. So they only even had 40% of what they originally had. Uh, to start with. So when they attacked Poland, they actually gained a huge Jewish population. So in 1939, they took over 3 million Jews in Poland. And this is going to expand their uh, population of Jews. Most of the Jews, even at that point, though, from 1939 to 1941 uh, in Poland were ghettoized. There were some atrocities committed against the Jews, to be sure, uh, some horrible atrocities. But most of the Jews were put in ghettos, uh, made to do slave labor. Uh, they were they had uh, restricted rations, and so many did die of malnutrition ultimately over time and disease. But there was not a mass extermination of the Jews taking place until 1941. And when the, the Nazis began their campaign against the Soviet Union in June 1931, that is when the mass slaughter began of the Jews. And most of it initially was by shooting, not by uh, death camps. The death camps were only going to open in December 1931. So there was a progression going on here of intense, uh, the picking up the intensity of violence. And, and really, June 1931 was the beginning of the mass extermination of the Jews. So we have when this extermination began, but why did Hitler decide to exterminate the Jews? Well, that's a key question that many scholars have grappled with, and there's been a lot of discussion about this over the past 20 years, and not just why he did it, but actually when he did it, which actually is linked to the question of why. Uh, of course, he hated the Jews, and we understand that, but why did he ultimately decide to exterminate them rather than, say, uh, expel them, which was one of the things that he did initially when he came to power, uh, and which there were actual, when, even when World War II broke out, the, Hitler originally talked about pushing the Jews further east uh, and to just sort of push them out of the territories that the Germans had occupied. Uh, a couple of reasons why they ultimately ended up uh, exterminating them. One was that with the war on, it became incredibly difficult to expel the Jews. Uh, so what to do with these Jews that are in your occupied territories, uh, that became increasingly uh, difficult problem for uh, Hitler. So the question is then why why, and at what point did he actually decide to, to carry out this mass extermination? Well, the Christopher Browning, a prominent his, Holocaust historian, argues that Hitler made the decision in July 1941, and that he made the decision because of what Browning calls the euphoria of victory. That is, Hitler thought by in July 1941, Hitler thought he was going to defeat the Soviet Union. Now, of course, that didn't happen, as it turns out. But... Uh, 
Browning argues that's why Hitler decided to kill the Jews. Others, though, argue that Hitler didn't be, take the decision to kill the Jews until later when he realized he wasn't going to win uh, as quickly as he thought. And in fact, Christian Gerlach even argues that he didn't make the decision until December 1941 uh, when, the world, when the United States entered the war and it became a full-fledged world war because Hitler had made a prophecy in, uh, in January of 1939 before World War II that if this, world, if this war became a world war that it would result in the annihilation of the Jews in Europe. However, the, the death camps were already being constructed in October 1941. So my, in my own measured opinion, I believe probably the decision was made uh, before October 1941, at least, to exterminate all uh, European Jews. And the decision to exterminate all the Soviet Jews had already been taken in June to July of 1941. Now, other than Jews, what groups did Hitler target for extermination and why? Yeah, this is a very important question, too, because actually the Jews were not the first group who was targeted for mass extermination. People with disabilities were being slaughtered in the thousands before uh, the mass extermination of the Jews began. The extermination of people with disabilities began with a signed order. Well, there was actually an infant euthanasia program begun in the middle of uh, 1939, just before World War II broke out. And then in October 1939, just a month after the war broke out, Hitler signed an order to allow euthanasia, so-called euthanasia, which was basically killing of those pe people with disabilities, uh, uh, for adults as well. And, and so in, in January 1940, uh, several killing centers opened. There were, ultimately were six killing centers throughout Germany opened in which they uh, began gassing people with disabilities. Most of these people were people who were institutionalized, many with mental illnesses, but also people who were congenitally blind or deaf or had epilepsy and other kinds of illnesses as well. They were gassed with carbon monoxide gas, their bodies were burned, and then they were uh, uh, buried, uh, on, usually nearby. The, this killing campaign was going to kill 70,000 people with disabilities in the first year and a half. And then those killing centers were uh, shut down because of German protests and German uh, problems with it. But they still killed, uh, in a more decentralized way, another 130,000 people with disabilities throughout the rest of the war. The reason they killed people with disabilities largely was because they considered them biologically inferior too. So it was sort of the same reason that they were killing uh, Jews and people of other races. They thought they were racially inferior. Now, very interesting question for Christians today. When we think about the state of the church and what's happening throughout the United States and in other countries, uh, how did the Christian churches at, the, at that time respond to Nazi racism and the Holocaust? There was quite a varied response, depending on the theological stance of the various people. The German Protestant Church was very liberal theologically for the most part, and there actually was a wing of, uh, of the Protestant Church that was liberal theologically that embraced Nazi anti-Semitism and racism and tried to eliminate all Jewish elements from Christianity. So they got rid of the Old Testament. Uh, some of them even thought that Paul was a little too Jewish in his writings. And, and Hitler, by the way, also believed this that Paul was a little too Jewish, and so they didn't like a lot of Jew Paul's writings, so they sort of tried to trim down Christianity uh, and leave some maybe some moral elements and such, but uh, really not, uh, they obviously re relieved Christianity of any uh, of its uh, uh, traditional beliefs about sal Christ, salvation through Christ and things like that. So this is a very liberal wing. There were, however, uh, more conservative uh, Part, some of which formed the so-called Confessing Church, which opposed Nazi uh, incursions on the church, especially the attempt by the Nazi church officials to remove Jews from pastor positions. There were a small number of Jews who had converted to Christianity who were pastors in the Protestant church. And the Confessing Church uh, opposed the Nazis' attempt to remove them from power. And so the, the Confessing Church became an opposition force to the Nazis throughout the entire period. And many of them were thrown to concentration camps. Some of them were ultimately killed. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is one of the more famous examples of them who opposed the Nazi racism, and ultimately he paid for it with his life. And that's one other person to study as well. But of course, ideas have consequences. I want to encourage people again to get your book, Hitler's Religion, 
the twisted beliefs that drove the Third Reich. You can get a lot more information in there than this 28 and a half minute episode. Nevertheless, it's always a blessing to have Dr. Richard Weikart with us in his many areas of expertise. And this book right here is a very important book for you to get and to give to someone else as well. We need to get Christians educated about the past, about dictators, about genocide. Ideas have consequences. It's great to have ideas, but it's great when those are good ideas, not bad ideas. Unfortunately, logic and critical thinking are very underrated nowadays. Uh, people need to think critically. They need to uh, think and, and strategize how to reach the people around them with the truth, because the gospel is the ultimate solution here. Uh, Dr. Weikart, it's always a blessing to have you here. Thank you so much for being here once again and uh, informing our audience about Hitler and uh, his life and his ideology, his worldview, and, of course, the consequences of that. It's great to be with you, Tony. Friends, get this book. Check out Dr. Weikart's other work as well. Again, he's, he has five other books uh, available. He's been um, featured in different documentaries. If you've seen uh, Ben Stein's Expelled, he was featured in that. He was the guy who Ben Stein was uh, walking around with when they're talking about uh, Hitler and the concentration camps. Uh, very scholarly source. So I want to point you and encourage you to get Dr. Weikart's works. And again, get an extra copy to give to a friend or family member as well. But it's so important to get educated about dictators and genocide. And this common claim is made, oh, religion, all oh, organized religion that's caused more uh, wars than anything in history. Uh, more people have died from religion and from the church than anything else. No, that is not the case. Obviously, this is an empty assertion. There's no evidence behind it. But so commonly, people don't do their research. They hear something, and then they just go and repeat it without studying it for themselves. In fact, uh, atheistic humanism caused more deaths just in the last couple hundred years than all of history combined. If you look at the millions upon millions of people who were killed under genocides that took place in the last couple hundred years, uh, Hitler in the Third Reich only being one. But we need to study history so that we can hopefully not repeat it and edu educate other people. And also, too, notice the signs of how these genocides came about, how these dictators came into power. And the worldviews that were behind this are still alive today. And that's why, as I said, the gospel is the ultimate solution to this. Uh, getting the gospel out to people and people repenting and putting their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, being born again and being indwelled by the Holy Spirit, that is what uh, renews the mind, regenerates the heart, and really causes a person's worldview to change, regardless of how uh, bad of a worldview, quote-unquote, they had uh, previously. Please go to rachachristi.org. To find out more, please pray for us and support this ministry financially that allow this vital work to continue. And remember, when it comes to what we believe and why we believe it, truth matters.